All right. Welcome, everyone. I know I know most of you. Uh, for those of you who don't, I'm Dr. Jake Smith. Welcome to our Strategy Speaker Series event. Um, just before we get started, I know a lot of you have tons of questions. We're going to move the microphone up a little bit uh, after we uh, bring out our guests. So uh, once we get into the Q&A, feel free to just leave your seat, step in line, and ask away, engage. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to thank uh, the Flores MBA program. I wanted to thank Dana Hart and the team for uh, helping put this thing together and all the support that we have in being able to do this. Also, a huge thanks to Bridget Conrad. Where's Bridget? There's Bridget. Thank you, Bridget. This whole thing would not have happened without her. I uh, also want to give a quick shout out to my wife because without her support, but also for introducing me to this little show on Bravo, we wouldn't be having this event uh, here today. So uh, thank you everybody for being here, for joining. We're very excited to uh, talk to Craig and Jerry. And uh, before we get started, we got a quick short video to uh, kind of kick us off. Hey y'all, I'm Craig Conover and welcome to Sewing Down South. All right, can you uh, please join me in welcoming a warm round of applause to Craig Conover and Jerry Castellano. Hey guys, how's it going? Hey. All right. Where do you want me, right here? Wherever oh, you'd like. I'll, I'll get on the outside. All right. I'm Jerry. What's up everybody, thanks hey, for having everybody. us. I, uh, I'm, this is my first time at, uh, in Baton Rouge, and, uh, or is that how you say it? Right? Yeah, Baton Rouge, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I don't know how to do it. We got to see the stadium today and walk around campus, and it's been great, so hopefully we'll be back in the fall for a game, and uh, yeah, it's, we, where do we have lunch today? At the Chimes. Chimes. Yeah, so we're checking a few now. boxes off. That's right. Well, just to kind of kick things off before we open it up to the students, because it really is uh, all about you and your experience, I was hoping that both of you could just take a, take a couple minutes to talk about you know, where you're from, your path, you know, education, work, all that sort of stuff, to where you ultimately came together to found Sewing Down South. <coughs> sure. Um, excuse me. I'm originally from Fenwick Island, Delaware. I um, had a decent childhood, but... Uh, was bullied a lot at stages, and I was like, I need to get out of here. I need a new life. Got to start somewhere. So I went to Charleston, South Carolina, and um, I had never heard of it. Went there on senior week and kind of fell in love with it. And then I was a finance major in undergrad and then stayed for law school. Um, during law school, my second year of law school, this silly television show, uh, Southern Charm, found me. And... I couldn't decide, it took me like five months to sign because I had a good job at the time at my law firm and I was like, look, what would I regret more? Not doing it and wondering what if, or doing it and having to deal with consequences later, which eventually I did in front of the South Carolina Supreme Court when they were like, what is this crazy show you're on and why are you friends with felons and all this other <laughs> stuff? And fortunately I was sworn in after that. Um, and we just finished filming our eighth season of Southern Charm, but about three years ago, I, you know, was going through a breakup and had to leave my garden behind and my workshop. Um, but I still had my sewing machine. I thought I was going to make clothes, but clothes are really hard to make, and I was never taught how to actually make clothes. Uh, but I remembered how to make a pillow uh, from my home ec class in middle school. So when I was in middle school, we still had home ec, tech ed, uh, which I really think is important, but it's a whole nother talk. So we learned how to cook for half the year, and we learned how to sew the second half. And so I just started to make pillows, and I'd stay up and listen to Eminem and Taylor Swift and drink wine and just sew pillows, and it, uh, it was my escape at the time. And I just had this feeling that I might be on to something, and so I started to tease it a little bit on Instagram, saw the engagement I got, but I really didn't know how to move forward. I was like, am I going to have to hire a bunch of 
people from my community to come sew in my garage. Like, how can I really scale this? And also at that time, everyone was calling me, you know, an idiot because they're like, you're a lawyer. Like, what are you doing sitting around sewing? Like, and what I've come to learn through that is a lot of times if you have a good idea, no one else is going to sit there and tell you you have a good idea or they'd be doing it themselves. Um, also, a lot of people are scared to kind of pick up, you know, put energy into their side hustle or their passion project, which we'll get to. Um, but fortunately, I had supportive parents and they were like, You're, we don't know where you came from, but, you know, we love you and you can do whatever you think is right. And so I just kept sewing, and uh, eventually I got a phone call from Jerry one day. We had been we had met in college, and he was like, "What are you doing with your business?" And I was like, "Honestly, like I'm not sure. You know, I have all these pillows in my dining room, and all of these all this demand for them in my Instagram, but I can't make a decision on anything. I can't pick a logo, yeah. can't pick a name, <laughs> and my perfectionism was keeping me from thinking the pillows were good enough to sell. So he called me." Uh, I, one challenge that I had to get over real quick was him and his sister-in-law wanted equal equity in the company, um, which is something that I'll tell you now is, is totally worth it. You can either have a little of something big, potentially big, or I could have all of nothing, you know, all of my little dining room company. So, um, I'm, and I fully support, and I know we'll get to this, but I fully support finding a partner, giving up some equity, and having someone come in and help you because the things that would hold me up, they could decide right away or give me the options. And it just, it, it's a magical formula that we have now. We have a branding expert, our partner, Aunt Amanda, we have an operations expert, and then we have the creative side. And uh, so we launched our company on April 1st in 2019 as kind of a middle finger to everyone else because they were like, wait, is this an April Fool's joke or is it real? <laughs> and um, after two years of being uh, an e-commerce company, we launched our flagship store in Charleston, South Carolina this past May. So it's kind of a quick breakdown, but I, I'm definitely, when I do these things, I love meeting all of you and engaging, but the questions and answers, you know, after Jerry, that I, I just love interacting because... I don't want to bore anyone. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> Who knows that's, what that's, that's my job every other day, Craig. Yeah. That's not um, your job. Yeah, I always get myself in a little bit of trouble by the network, which especially in this book, because there's definitely some behind the scenes stuff. Um, not too much, but I definitely got an angry call from NBC being like, What are you thinking? And I was like, Hey guys. We can end it right there. Yeah. We don't have to keep going. I'm just kidding. I'm but kidding. I th hopefully you guys enjoy it. Yeah. Um, I'm not on TV. Uh, I'm Jerry <laughs> Castellano. Um, Craig and I, we did meet in college, so I grew up in Greenville, South Carolina, went to college at Charleston, and was undergrad was business and marketing, worked there for a couple years, and then went and got my master's degree at Georgetown in D.C. Uh, with a specialization, it was business, MBA, and a specialization in sports management, marketing, thought I was going to be the GM of a football team because I was 23 and had no idea what the hell I was talking about, and uh, had to intern for a couple uh, semesters during grad school took me to a company where I interned and then eventually, fast forward 13 years forward now, 14 years, whatever it might be, uh, partners in a sports agency out of DC. So we represent a lot of brands like Red Bull, Hyundai, FedEx, Intel on all their athlete endorsement deals. So who they sign, why they sign them, and then their activation plan. So how all of you know that back in the day, Reggie Bush represented Red Bull, right? Or Ricky Fowler's a Red Bull athlete, right? His golf towel, so forth and so on. You do a lot of talent endorsement deals, pro uh, procurement um, for like keynote speeches, and then um, hospitality. So we do hospitality at major events around the world, like the Masters, the Derby, Wimbledon. So what that means is our corporate clients come to us, a lot of IT firms, law firms, financial firms, and we put, you, know, you want to go to the Masters, entertain 20 of your clients, here's your drivers, your chefs, your tickets, your talent coming to talk to you, so forth and so on. Um, and that's you know, my normal life. And then <laughs> you don't normally get into business with friends and family. It gets a little iffy, but uh, my wife, her sister is really um, strong in the strategy uh, and marketing side of business. She did the dollar menu. Yeah, she helped create the dollar menu at, um, at McDonald's. And we were, I think it was Thanksgiving. It's in the book, but we were at their house and she's like, watching Southern Charm. I'm like, I know Craig, we went to college together. He's two years older than, or younger than me. And she's like, do you think you'd do pillows? I'm like, I don't know, I'll call him. So eventually he got back to me because at this point, Craig was not getting back to people quick. <laughs> and um, he, you know, we went back and forth for a little bit. 
and we're like, well, let's do this. We created a pitch deck, said, here's this. Like you said, we were like, we were really gung ho on the equity because it's like, it's either going to work and be great or it's just going to be a dud and so goes life. And it was something we tried. Well, we worked on it. We eventually agreed on everything um, and we launched the company. It's turned into what it has. And now because of that, I also represent Craig and a couple other people on shows, but Craig was like, and honestly, it's the greatest thing we've ever did probably because it allows us to be completely in sync, right? There's not another person or an agent or a manager we have to get approval from to do something. It's like, do you want to do it? Great, we can do it. And it doesn't affect our business. Um, it's turned into a complete juggernaut that's been a lot of fun for us. Um, I think the most important part of this, and we've talked about this a lot, like we're really open book. Like we want you guys to get a lot out of this. It's not meant to be like, we're not going to agree on everything you ask us. I promise you that. Well, we so, don't like, agree on most things. Yeah, and that's and a good part of it. you like, healthy dynamic exactly. of a partnership because. And you should ask, you, know, you guys are in positions now where you'll be graduating, I think most of them in May, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Uh, you're going to be going out into the real world. Um, you're going to have a little shock on what you think you deserve and what you should have and what reality really is and what it's going to give you, especially in this crazy time of COVID and coming out of it. Um, but I think it's Craig's entire story is it's like, if you believe in yourself and trust yourself, go chase it and, and figure it out. Right. So, um, don't be scared or hesitate to ask anything yeah. up here. Well, and I'll That's give you a little here. portfolio of the company. I know I kept saying company and didn't really explain it. So sewing down south, we started with throw pillows. Uh, my goal was always to have basically a new William Sonoma. Um, I love, you know, I wanted to be the male Martha Stewart. Uh, and I know it's kind of an opposite movement, not opposite, but it was a step outside of a lot of gender stereotypes to be in that. There weren't a lot of straight males in home decor. And we kind of just embraced that and ran with it. Um, we've had an awesome success through, you know, messages and meeting people through motivating them to step out of their comfort zone and just do what they want to do and not listen to anyone else. Anyway, we have, we found a factory in Beaufort, South Carolina. So we make pretty much everything there. Uh, we've got eight small families, small family businesses goes into making our products. Um, throughout the Southeast. And, you know, it went from a pillow company to kitchenware to now we're gonna launch bedding in August, which is really fun, yeah. and sleeping pillows. And you're just constantly looking for that next step. I mean, for a long time, I was my own worst enemy. I mean, I still am. And just moving, moving it all was debilitating to myself and they helped with that. But something I figured out was like, just do something. Even if it's a move backward or ends up being a move backward, as long as you're moving, you'll eventually do enough things right that you start to see some sort of a success. And that forward momentum is, you know, everything. That's why I love flying around and doing stuff like this because if I sit still in Charleston too long, it's just, it's not as good as when I have this type of structure. So we're constantly looking for new products. Their motivation with me is the more you know, the better our sales are, the more we solve everything we already have, you can then make new products. Um, and you know, the goal is to just continue building that brand. We're getting to a point now where we do not own the factory that makes all of our stuff in Buford, but maybe that's the next step. And you kind of excite yourself by moving um, yeah. forward. But yeah, it's a home, home decor. I'm sure we'll get into it a little bit. Like when we started, it was in my mind, right? Like we definitely had different opinions on what we were doing and Amanda too. It's like, great e-commerce business. It's an annuity in my mind. Like we're going to set it up, barely going to have to touch it and we're going to grow it and it's going to be side money and I'm good. We never wanted a store. He did. Zero uh, inventory. And, it, well, it, and I think that's what's fun about starting businesses. I know we're kind of jumping into it, but mm -hmm. like, so when we started Sewing Down South, in, and the book's actually really great because it takes, it's not a reality TV book. It's about truly like Craig, but how, how we started the business and how it's changed him and what it's brought him to. But when we started the business, I mean, I'm literally Googled the word textile. I'm like, I don't know what the hell this really means. Like, <laughs> let's figure it out. Right. So we did. And, um, I relied on somebody who already was making pillows, uh, an individual in Greenville, South Carolina. She kind of taught me what I needed to know with the factory in North Carolina. So the only thing when we launched on April 1st that we held inventory on, which he hated, but I was like, from a business standpoint, let's not sink a bunch of money in an inventory. We have no idea what's going to happen. This is crazy. Yeah, we started the company hats. for 3000 Yeah, from $3,000 uh, with legal fees and a couple hats and blah, blah, blah. And all the pillows. So if you came on the website for the first, I'd say three months of the business, we, we at the end of the month, or the end of the week, sorry, we'd take the orders, 
send them to the factory, they would print them on demand, cut them, sew them, and then ship them back to us, me in DC, Craig in Charleston, and we would package them up and ship them out to the customer. And at the time, we only did cases, like decorative pillowcases, not inserts. Again, Craig will have a different take. Yeah, because everyone them. in the world that had been following my journey was like, oh, Craig finally started his pillow company and he's shipping pillows to us that are incomplete. Like the pillows show up without exactly. an actual pillow. <laughs> I knew what I was going to face with that. Also, without doing inventory, the pillows took four to five weeks to get to you, which I was very against, especially in the day with Amazon Prime. Even if you're not ordering from Amazon, you're still going to get your stuff within a week. Yeah. Um, so these were things we definitely didn't agree on in the beginning. And Two versus three, Amanda and myself versus Craig, so we won. Yeah. But <laughs> what would happen is, so you, you, you take calculated risk. And for us, it was smarter to do that than invest in a bunch of inventory. Um, so we built it up that way. And, and then the biggest thing about the inserts was at the beginning, one, we didn't have room in our house to have a ridiculous amount of inserts shipped to us. And two, the logistically of shipping those, like we were shipping things in poly mailers, right? So then throwing that in a box and trying to get like, that's, man, we're just trying to get off the ground, right? So then eventually we shifted to another factory in South Carolina. And now we have two, one in South Carolina, one in North Carolina that um, cut and sew for us. We have a printer. We have one in North Carolina, one in South Carolina as well, um, just because the volume has grown to this point. But it's something that, again, most people, most overhead is what kills businesses. They think they need the fancy, cool office. They need all the good stuff. Yeah, and it's like, that's how you I get like destroyed, that. right? And, and you would agree with me on that. It's the number one killer. Um, and we were like, let's stay lean and mean. We don't want, we would want to give any other equity to anybody. And at this point, the company three years in, about to be three years, April 1st, we're completely self-funded. Yeah. We haven't taken a dollar from anybody. We've obviously opened up a store that half a million dollars in inventory. It went from zero inventory to having over half a million dollars in inventory in three He's years. He's definitely the reason we make you money, know? though, because I would give everything away. That's and when I'm in the true. store, a lot of times... He does give it we, away. For we free. see that. Um, <laughs> but having a partner that knows the, pri the primary purpose of having the business is to make money uh, is good. So we are... He's a lot colder, I'm a lot friendlier, and... Uh, <laughs> Such a nice guy. Yeah, it's, nice it's a good thing. But anyway, that's kind of our base and foundation, so... There's a lot more to it, obviously, and I think... Well, they don't care. No, 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 I'm saying, like, there's a lot more. It, it didn't just happen. Like, I don't think, and I think that's, like, part of this whole conversation, what we want with questions, is, like, we're talking about this in three years, like, it was great. There were so many hiccups, like, with massive orders along the yeah. way, um, you know, like... The Bohemian Pillows, when we launched them for charity to rate, we wound up raising forty thousand dollars. But like seven hundred people ordered pillows, and we're like, we don't even have one in stock. Like, what the hell are we supposed to do? And it took us ten weeks to get them done, and then they were wrong tagged. It was a nightmare. But um, I mean, it's definitely been littered with issues. But at the end of the day, it's like working through those. It's made it fun. I'd say. You bet. All right, let's open it up to questions from the students. So, like I said, just kind of start the line right in front of the mic and we'll kick things off. Uh, I'm an open book. It doesn't have to be about any specific topic, but um, within you can, reason. You can, you, can, you, can, you can get up, get in yeah. line. Well, you can watch Jerry's face as I answer yeah. stuff to see. <laughs> no one have phones out. No one send it to the Bravo blogs. Anybody? Uh, you can tell everyone. <laughs> tell the world. That's what What's I up, want. man? Hey, y'all. Um, thanks for coming. Yeah. Big fan. I've watched uh, me, that, the Southern Charmers actually show my mom Kate got in, got into like when I was in high school, awesome. and it was like the thing that we would do together, especially That's before cool. I went to college. And now, like while I was in college, while I was in, in my MBA, call her up and be like, "Oh, did you see the news?" That's awesome. So it's been a really good thing. That's great, us. man. Thank you. So but cool. um, the question I had was about uh, you mentioned how social media and especially like Instagram, you saw the engagement. Um, what have you seen, and what are some tips you have for like building your brand through social media and and, <coughs> and also like managing it? Uh, I mean, it's a great question. We So that was one thing that bringing on our partner Amanda helped with because she was an expert in it. I know that our numbers reflect how active I am on social media. So I it's another thing I overthink. I'm like, oh, is this post good enough to post? Is this story funny enough to post? And what I, I challenged myself and what I'm working on is stop overthinking stuff and just do it. Um, and now I've started this little thing like travels with Craig because I'm always flying around and for, I feel so shy posting stuff or bringing my phone out that for some reason traveling, I don't feel that shy. And it really has nothing to do with the business, but it's like, it builds engagement and then people start to ask, you know, questions. So it's not the best answer, but for me, it's just 
staying active on it. Um, I'm a big proponent of incentive. I think the world's run on incentives, so we love to do sales on our social media and quizzes and games and giveaways. Um, we're always always doing stuff like that. I mean, yeah. Do you have, I mean, you yell at me all the time for yeah, not all the time. being busy, like for not posting enough. But it truly is. I mean, our. I was very fortunate we were, but I have a foundation from Bravo, and the Bravo universe is like, it's an incredible foundation. But, you know, without that, well, with that being said and acknowledging that, we didn't spend a dollar on marketing for 12 months. Um, and now we've kind of figured out a good way to do it with Instagram and Facebook, and they're, they're, the, the numbers you get from that are pretty great. But um, I, I look, if you didn't have the foundation that we had for social media, I was saying earlier to one of the news stations, using charity, like charity can be your best friend. Even if you say you're just giving some proceeds or something from your business and you start to put that out on social media, you start to get a lot more people interested in your business and a lot more news stations, local media, because they have a reason to follow you. So it's kind of off track of what you're saying, but if you're trying to build your social media up, finding something to talk about or finding a reason for people to follow you other than your business is, is usually a good strategy. What's your name? Uh, Tommy. Tommy? Yeah. Thanks for your question, man. Yeah, thank and you. being number one, we appreciate it. So and you're going to love the new Tommy season. First. What, what yeah, I would say... Your mom and... Your mom's going to love the new season, by the way. <laughs> we'll see how much we love it from, from our standpoint. He's probably not going to like it. If we get, if, but. If, well, I'll add to it. So one thing, and I've worked with a bunch of athletes and entertainers in my life, and I, we were talking about this at, at lunch. So kind of two different parts to your question, right? Authenticity is why this works, right? People have watched it on the show, and it's come to fruition. We're not slinging CBD or some tea or some face mask or something. Like, yeah, it's home decor and pillows, but it's because of the journey that Craig's been on and how he, in person, he's generally one of the best. Like, I mean it. He like really is a great human being, 99% of the time. But the one percent you learn to deal with and just kind of push aside, right? So when you're trying to build your own um, base, right? Like being authentic is super important, right? And just being active. Like there's so much content out there in the world. Everyone's fighting for it. So it's like, what are you doing to differentiate yourself from what everybody else is doing, right? And if you're just trying to get out there to get paid, like it's like also, I think the firm quite like, what are you doing it for? Like, why are you trying to build your brand if your brand doesn't have a purpose or a reason to it anyways? Like, what, just to have a 10,000 followers on Instagram? You know, like, I think if there's a fundamental reason underneath for that, then there's a reason to grow your, your following. Otherwise, you might not have it, right? Like, I have zero reason to grow my following, right? I don't want anybody to know anything. It's like, great, stay away. <laughs> but Craig, on his, and what he does and what we do with the company, it's very measured and, and tailored to what we're trying to do. And like he says, when he posts, yeah, you'll see analytics. It's very clear, like, here it's we go free, up, right? Yeah. And he does have the base from Southern Charm, so we're fortunate. But when we spend money on ads in Christmas time, you know, a normal company might see three, three and a half row ads, and, and which is return on ad spend, but we see 10 to 16, Texting, which is we have a huge return on texting, Our too. SMS, yeah. So we'll have QR codes. We have hit points all throughout the store, even like on the cards that we passed out, I think, so, on the back. Yeah. And every time, you know, you, you basically tailor it to look like there's a purpose for the QR codes, but it's really just data mining for yourself. And so now our company has thousands and thousands and thousands of text mess or phone numbers and email addresses that, you know, when something does go on sale, we send out a text. And our return rate on that has been incredible, and yep. it was free to capture. Because so. emails are like, emails are waning, SMS is going up, SMS will eventually go down and something else will come in. So when all of you go home tonight and you scan that QR code on the back of the, on the card that you got, because you're all going to do really it. Really stealing your it, it's, <laughs> it's going to pop us. up and it'll, no. say, it'll automatically pop up a text message. And it'll, we already, it pre puts in a message and you just hit send, and then it kicks you back a link to get a signed copy of the book, right? And order it. On our side, what we're doing is getting your email, or sorry, your text number, and then you're unknowingly, not you, you opt in to messaging from us, right? Um, and our other partner, Amanda, actually owns the technology and patent on that specific, um, I don't know what it is, SMS technology, we'll call it. So we don't have to share that with anybody. We own it all. And then it just drastically increases sales for us. So, you know, unknowingly, it works out really well. Go for it. Hi, 
everyone, my name is Maddie. Maddie. And of course, thinking about when you founded the business and then when you expanded into your actual flagship store, of course I thought about COVID. But second to that, I mean, home decor has had kind of a unique experience in COVID because everyone's stuck at home. So everyone's renovating and I assume adding um, and redecorating. So can you talk about your experiences with that, like good and bad, how has it affected you? Yeah, so we, um, it's an excellent question because it really did apply to us. We were very fortunate to be in that business when everyone was making their home a place for a staycation. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, and we really catered to that. We actually started to make face masks out of our factory in South Carolina, so we were technically a critical business. The face mask ended up being an incredible sales point for us. We donated most of those proceeds, and uh, we would donate a mask for every mask gold. I mean, this is in the early days when no one knew what the heck was going on, um, if anyone still does. But uh, then I was like, look, guys, and the, the true statement is just this, and it doesn't matter where you land on it. Charleston was a place that decided it didn't want to have any rules. And I saw that happening. I was like, Charleston is not going to start locking down businesses. So I started to really push for this story. I was like, I know it's a weird time, but we can get a great deal on a, on, on a lease, which we did. And we could really take kind of a risk when a lot of people weren't. And so... I kind of announced it on Instagram that we were opening a store without really talking to them about it and forced their <laughs> hand into it. And But they believed me. And Jerry yeah. was able to negotiate this lease down to almost a, probably a 40% discount off what Shit. King Street really usually is. And um, all of a sudden, Charleston started to see a ton of COVID tourism from the Northeast and a lot of places where, again, it had nothing to do with us. We just put the store out there. If people wanted to come, they could come. And it ended up being a home run for us because Charleston's tourism numbers were 10x what they usually are in the last yeah. year. Yeah. So let's back this up a little bit and give you the, the really real story. I'm just kidding. So what happened was he really wanted the store. We did a big deal with the Beach Leads, a subscription box company, and it was very profitable. And I was he was on HSN. If you, you guys know what HSN is at this point, I know. We're old. I get it. Like, well, Home Shopping Network, he crushed it. We were doing a photo shoot, I think, the next day. They signed the deal. Beachley did. And I was like, if you really want that store, like, against everything in my body, we, let's go do this. Well, it was a risk. And it was a huge risk. So we found... Um, a location on King Street and he loved it and I I liked it but I hated it for it was a new build so we were gonna have to build the rest of it out it's just the core I mean the expense we would have spent 150 grand on it and we we didn't have 150 grand to throw that down in my opinion um, so he's yelling Amanda's like she definitely doesn't want to do the store I'm kind of in the middle we eventually agree that that's not the right one we find the store we're in now he didn't want to look at it, and then he did. He called immediately and was like, sign the lease. And I'm like, we need to negotiate first. So then we eventually get it like two, three weeks later. Yeah. So mind you, I'm gonna give you a little timeline. I live in DC at this point still, okay? I now live in Charleston. This is February, 2021. We find and sign the lease March 15th, COVID. We get the keys April 1st to start upfitting and doing what we need to and start ordering all the products basically in March and trying to figure out what we're doing. We hired 12 people, open a store and open it on May 15th, 90 days, never opening a store ever in our lives in the middle of COVID. And then fortunately, May 14th, Charleston dropped the mask mandate. We opened on May 15th to like 700 people in line. It was the craziest weekend of our like, It was generally the craziest weekend. I looked at him on that first day. I was like, oh, we're good. Well, and, like, we're good. Like, this is good. And Jerry and Amanda were like, look, it goes against any, any classic type of business knowledge or anything you're told. Basically, everything in the books at the point, and I love books, obviously, we all love <laughs> business books here. That's why I had, but Pillow everything talk, in his book. past was telling him no. And that's kind of where our dynamic relationship comes in because all I had was basically street business smarts from selling golf balls on a golf course when I was little or doing whatever else I did coming up. And uh, it just felt right. So that's kind of was our COVID experience with it. And he was working on the book. We started the, I want to say we, the idea of the book was 
Um, it was right during the beginning of COVID, so we'll call it March 2020, and it's now coming out in a couple weeks, right? So that was a much longer process than we thought, but he didn't think he should have a book. And, Let's get the next question, Jerry. But no, but the whole point is like you're going through all this during COVID, like you're asking, and the challenges that we faced during COVID, I, I actually, like, it, it was a benefit to us because it allowed us to focus on the business and understand what we were really good at. Um, and I don't, if COVID didn't happen, I don't think we have a store. Well, no, I mean, so. look, some people, like there was some fortunate stuff that came out of it. And for us, we took that time to really focus on the company. So awesome. thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Hey guys, thank hey. you all for being here. I'm Grace. It's great to meet y'all. Hey Grace. Um, I'm curious about, I don't know, y'all's little kid dreams. I mean, did you ever dream of starting a company? Either of y'all, if you dreamed of making pillows in your home at class, um, and also now that you're doing it, does it feel like sewing down south is a long-term thing, or is this a jumping off? Point? Good question. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, I'm coughing. <coughs> yeah, so I... Um, I used to sell golf balls on the golf course when I was like 10. I would fish them out of the pond and sell them with sodas for a dollar, golf balls for 50 cents or three for a dollar. Um, and I just loved that thrill of interpersonal exchange uh, and making a sale. And I kind of developed a love of money. Um, but it was really for healthy purposes. I've always had huge philanthropic goals. Um, but I always knew that I wanted to do something for myself. and. I, for years on the show, I would beat myself up. I'm like, how do I not have a product yet? I was like, it's being handed to me. This found, like this platform is being handed to me. I had no, you know, there's so many more struggles out there that I didn't have to face and I just couldn't come up with something. And I read something one day and um, it basically said, tomorrow is the first day of the rest of your life. And that statement, got me through pretty much the last five years of my life where I didn't feel guilty, I didn't feel sorry for myself. I was like, look, if you start tomorrow, you can build something. And it was worth it, like there was a hustle. Like I've worked at law firms, I've been on TV, um, I bartended for years. And you know, I love doing all those things, but I always felt like something was missing. And I didn't know what it was gonna be, but, and that's kind of, the fun part of it, but I kind of knew when I made the pillow, I was like, this is what I've been looking for. And now that we're in it, I was very fortunate and him and Amanda that we had primary income jobs when we started this. So we're not blind to that at all, but now it's become our primary income, which has been a blast. And when you actually have that power, it's worth anything that you've been through because you, I don't have to be scared of the network anymore. I don't have to be worried about them not bringing me onto a new TV show. And they can't tell me what to do and we just yell at each other. And now we have employees, which are great. I mean, Madison that's here, she was an engineer and now she found herself on our team in Charleston. She went to Alabama. Yeah, <laughs> but she's from here. She was born Everybody here. Everybody look at Madison. Um, Madison, say hi. But, uh, <laughs> but so we, we've discovered in building this company, we have someone just deferred law school to come work um, for us. And we just find ourselves with a whole bunch of people that didn't plan on being where we are. Uh, it's everything that I thought it would be, again, only because I have two partners. I mean, I get to focus on, like I'm the you know chief creative officer and that's what I get to do. I get to make stuff that I love. And um, you know, he gets to figure out how to make us money. A lot of times I'll get on the website just to make sure he didn't mess with anything and our candles will be like, three dollars more and I'll be like and then I throw a fit and I'm like we don't have thirty five dollar candles Jerry they're worth thirty two dollars and not thirty five but he's always trying to make us a little extra money which is great because I don't want to be doing that and um, and it's but yeah I'm like I said sometimes I go off on tangents but the I always knew I wanted to work for myself my dad started a, a water restoration business when I was little they do like smoke damage water damage construction and he was able to be at all my baseball games, all my brother's soccer games, and I just, that was the path that I wanted for me and my future family. But yeah, when I was 30 and I didn't have a business, which isn't even that late, I was like, what am I doing? And uh, then I saw a postcard too that had, you know, this, the age of the guy that started Uber, the age of the guy that started Red Bull, or uh, Five Hour Energy, like the lady that started, there was all these very successful companies and they were all in their 40s and 50s. And I was like, okay, there's time, you're gonna be just, okay, just, you know, do something, but. 
Yeah, to, to answer that, I'd say, like, he's talking about, like, I'm not called wheeling and dealing, but, like, when I I'll probably definitely date myself on this, but I remember being in seventh grade, and I would go to, like, a books a million, which probably don't exist anymore, <laughs> and I'd go, like, trade Pokemon cards with these kids who didn't know what they were doing, and I'd go on eBay, and I'd sell them on eBay. Like, that was my thing. I was like, how do I always make money? Like, yeah, like I just want to know how to try to figure out how to make money. I'll take two Charizards. Yeah, yeah two, they were, those were holographic, <laughs> yeah. expensive, man. So what would happen is, like, that was my thought. I, I probably wouldn't have ever told you, like, my dad was in sales and ran companies in, growing up, so I'd be like, I'm going to be in sales, right? And I think our education system does a horrible job in telling us and teaching us, like, what to do or where to go and so forth and so on. So I went to college, did that, and I was like, I'll do sales. And it, when I went to grad school, you know, I might have been a couple years older than where, you, where most of you are right now, like, I wouldn't tell you I was going to be doing, I sure as hell wasn't going to own a pillow and home decor company, I can tell you that much. But I thought, like I said earlier, I'd be the GM of a football team. I thought anything else. But then you get into the industry and you understand there's so many other possibilities that you never knew existed. Um, and then on top of that, like, I always knew I could never work for a major corporation because, like, there's guidelines. And I don't like that. I like to play in the gray area and try to really push myself and understand things. And if you go to certain, some people like that. It just wasn't for me. So I think now at this point, like Craig says, <laughs> I know working for myself, I don't want to rely on anybody else to make me my money. Like, I want to be the one, if I fail, it's on me, it's not on you, right? It's all, it's strictly on me, um, unless Craig goes and posts something dumb. That's a little different, <laughs> which he won't do. But um, that that was the most important thing to me because I think, and, and you guys will figure this out as you come out, You have, like, one, the job you're going to get when you come out of grad school is not going to be your last job, right? Um, you're going to have a lot as you go through your career. You're probably going to switch careers. You might not love what you do when you first come out. And, and that's completely normal, and that's what you should do. And if you're not interning like crazy right now, you're hurting yourself because um, this is like a little – I've said this to him. It's like you should be really proud of yourself that you're getting your MBA. It's, it's impressive. But if you think that that's going to automatically get you more money or automatically get you a job – because you have your MBA, that's not the truth, right? Because when we look at people, we get people with MBAs all the time and any of the businesses we're involved with and they don't have any experience. I'm like, well, that's great, but you don't have any real world experience. Like I will take the person probably with real world experience over somebody who just flat out has an MBA, right? So what I would say is if you guys are like, and it also helps you sort out what you think you want to do, right? Because you think you want to be, go work for McKinsey or some big firm, and then you're going to get there and you're like, I don't really want to do this. And you're going to go another way. Um, and then some of you will figure out that you want to work for yourself and you're going to take a risk and start your own business. Just do it in a very measured, smart way to where you don't hurt yourself. You're all relatively young. Take every chance in the world right now because you don't have to worry about mortgage, kids, everything else, right? So like if you're gonna take the chance, take it now. That would be But we would take would the person with an MBA and experience over just the person Nailed it. with experience. Yeah, really so. we would. <laughs> so good. <laughs> Hi, my name is Andrea. Um, my question is about inventory forecasting. Um, you guys have a lot of products and variants, so I was just wondering what what challenges you guys have had and what advice do you have for overcoming those challenges? Who planted this question? I don't know. <laughs> no, I mean, this is a wonderful well, especially question. In this time, like the time we're living in and everything's stuck on boats scattered oh. around the world. It's been absolutely crazy it a phenomenal question um, i'm so this pisses me off excuse me like every day because i'll walk in and my favorite candles aren't in the store or my favorite pillows Madison? you want to like, come answer this one i'll go to sell someone something and it's not there and then obviously because i'm not the one handling it every day um they just roll like just laugh yeah, because they, it's a nightmare for them. It's, and uh, so the way the containers, can yeah, I mean, the way the containers and everything are going, like, so that big Beachley deal we did is really interesting. When we did it, we had certain materials coming, you have to have certain raw goods coming from overseas, right? Well, when we did it, it was right before shipping skyrocketed. So we did a, a full deal on the price included, landed duties, taxes, everything paid in the United States for the raw goods. And then by the time they got it to ship it, I think the rates went from like $4,000 a container to like $18,000. And they came back to us and they were like, I was like, mm, man, you did the deal. Like, 
send it over here. And they took a bath on it. And like, that's a horrible, for nobody could forecast for that, right? So now as we, we're, and uh, honestly, Madison, if you do want to come up and well, talk, we do, you can. We do, percentage, we do a percentage of our past sales. We, for, we like, look at past data to, to look, but it's also hard because our store, I mean, we've been e-commerce. Our store has been open for nine months. I mean, so we only have so much data, right? Um, and we just take really measured approaches. We, we tend to look at, we look at past data and then we look at quantity price breaks on things we're ordering, right? And we measure out the risk of ordering too much versus the delta that we're gonna save by ordering you know, 145 versus 144. It's just an example on a price break. Um, and then we honestly get on a, we have a group uh, company call every single Tuesday night, Craig, myself, Amanda, Madison, Jack, and Kelly, who are like the, everybody who kind of runs the business as a whole. And we talk through it and we go, like there is no business plan of sewing down south. If you walk in, it's like there's a 50 page document. I mean, this is like, we're not winging it anymore, but at the same time, it's like, it's every day is a different challenge and we're trying to sort it out. So there really is no great answer to your question outside of, like the biggest thing for us is fabric. So we had a call yesterday and it's like, okay, we're about to bring on home goods as a client um, and start supplying a special line of home goods, which will be an ungodly amount of pillows. Well, that means there's a lot of fabric we need to be able to have and fabric comes from overseas. So now we're going, all right, we're, you know, we gotta, we're supposed to have something in this month, fabric, and somebody just replied today. I was like, mm, yeah, it's coming April 1st now. And we're like, Okay, so who do we know domestically that we can have fabric to hold us over, right? And you have to then hopefully get it at a price that isn't too too far off. Um, our margins can sustain that in the store. Like if our fabric goes up two dollars a yard, right? We can deal with that and fulfill from a domestic source. But at home goods, like it's razor thin margins because you're going to do massive quantity. We couldn't sustain that, right? Um, uh, it's just a really, really but big just, balance. We just do inventory for the store though is based off proof of concept. So, you know, when I first wanted to do the candles, they ordered 50 of each one or 25 of each one, and then they're like, "This is on you to sell them." They sold out, and so now then we got to order 500, and now they yeah. finally trust the candles will sell. So it's really just a conversation in store. You have to think about storage. We've got, you know, storage containers downtown. Um, but we just kind of, we start low and then yeah. we grow big. Very rarely do we go, and again, it goes back to what I said earlier about overhead. Like, we're not going to go order 20,000 units of something because we know that it's not going to work that well for us. And if it does, I'd rather pay a higher price at the beginning for 100 or 400 of them prove that it sells, make him happy that it sells, it makes me happy it sells, then we'll go order 2,000 and now our margins go up. But we've, we're not hurting ourselves by allocating funds to something that isn't going to work. And that was like the whole purpose of how we started the business. Um, and honestly, it's just a group conversation. He says, he, I take myself out of all the, like, the design and all that stuff because you definitely don't want my style doing anything. But when it comes to the numbers and everything, that's a, we fight about it all the time. He's like, why don't we have more of this? I'm like, because we're not going to spend the money on it right now. And then he's like, I want more of this. And then he typically reverts to going on Instagram and telling everybody in the world what we're going to do. And then we have to figure out how to do it. So like, <laughs> that's our business plan is how do we, how do we figure every second of the day out in real time? It's, it's hard. Good job. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, um, I was curious about what y'all's like design process is for coming up with like new pillows and products and stuff like that, and how your involvement has changed in that process since going from your dining room doing it completely by yourself to a team full of people. <coughs> how about yeah. it? Um, so now it looks a lot like I sketch. I usually sketch on planes or in a hotel room and I have, we found an amazing artist that just graduated from college in Charleston that is able to turn my sketches into realistic renderings that we can use. Um, so her and I have a great relationship. That process, she'll come back with something that's either close or not very close at all and we just go back and forth. Because I can see it in my head, I just can't do what she can. I don't have that artistic ability. Um, and so in the beginning, I was going to fabric shops, buying fabric, making pillows out of them. Once we had an established company and brought on that artist, then we can make our own patterns, which has been great. Um, and we actually base our stuff, which I didn't see us going in this direction, with kind of 
things happening in the moment. So, you know, my girlfriend a couple weeks ago just made a caption on her photo that said, so in love, uh, spelled S-E-W. And now we have so in love merch. And, um, and it just kind of took off. And so we're kind of adapting in real time for things that are actually happening. We do use, you know, my appearances on television when they're, you know, sometimes they're good for us, sometimes they're not great for us. But um, we take from that, we take, you know, in the beginning it was a lot from where I traveled, my experiences. The first pillow we did was a Maryland blue crab, you know, where I'm from in the Northeast. My family's from Baltimore. I mean, you guys have a ton of seafood down here. I think you have crabs too. And um, I knew that everyone from that area had an awesome, like, fail. Do, you, do you not? You have two crabs. <laughs> Don't you Crawfish. have crabs down here? Crawfish. 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 Yeah, I know that, but like a lot of times they'll ship crabs from like, um, anyway. They have crabs. Anyway, <laughs> I, it would be like using crawfish for you guys. And I knew everyone that saw the crab would want it because it, it meant like family gatherings to them, awesome events in their life, awesome memories. And so our first pillow was Maryland, Maryland blue crab. And it, it did what I knew it would. The people had a, wanted that on their couch so that when they walked in the room, it brought back memories for them. And so then we kind of went down a line of different areas and that's where the inspiration came from. Thank you. Yep. Hey y'all, um, I have two questions if that's okay. Sure. One's serious and one's fun though. <laughs> so the first one I wanted to know is how you guys define and measure your success individually and then also as a company against others in the industry. I think, um, well, you probably have the business answer that, you know, we're able to stay afloat and pay our employees and take money. For me, I measure my success on my philanthropic side. So as long as, like, that's, that's how I'm, like, removed from all of this, whatever I'm able to do on that side of things is what drives me. Um, we're hopefully going to finalize our 501c3 this year for the Craig Conover Foundation, and that's, that'll be what everything that I work for. Um, as a company, Sewing Down South's given away, I think, 200000 or $250,000 yeah, in our first three years to various causes um, around the country and overseas, and that's, that's what drives me. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I would say, as you might not believe it, that it's not really the money. I think that's just age kind of changes your opinion on things. Well, I think we just, you won't have to make money, like, obviously, but... For us, it's it's not that like we have we set certain metrics. We wanted to hit a certain goal in sales this year. We did, but like what's more fun for us and, and uh, dead honest is like we have an unbelievable staff that works with us. Like incredible, really fortunate with Madison. Like in all seriousness, uh, being able to give them bigger bonuses, yeah. giving them incentivization, like seeing that everybody. Like I said it to you guys when we walked in. Like we were upstairs. You guys are all like down here when we were upstairs talking to each other. Like that's really cool to see and really neat. Like there's you guys are a close knit group and to see our like it's our family. Like literally our our staff is a family. We we love them. We go out with like you know, we take them out. They go out with us. We have a lot of good times together and that's that's more fun to us than anything else because we are hitting our sales numbers. But at the end of the day, like we give a lot of money away and we try to make everybody else happy and then that and our, in turn makes it work. Our wild. employment like retention, I know we're new, but you know, everyone's happy for the most part that I'm aware of at the store and we just continue to you know, throw money. Like being able to I know like her and another guy that worked for us, um, we were able to give an incredible bonus to at the end of the year and like that was great. And I love having a happy staff and um, on a personal level, like this was probably a mandatory event, but <laughs> the fact that you guys showed up to be here is <laughs> awesome to me. Um, you know, just I, as long as people keep showing up to things like this in the store and I get to keep, you know, doing things like this, that's what makes it worth it. So. To, to your point on the retail store, it's been nine months, give or take. We've had two, one person leave because of a semester at, at sea. Uh, one of our original store managers uh, had to go back home for personal reasons. Other than that, every other person is the exact same that's since we've opened the store, which in a retail sense is mind-blowing. Um, so that's what makes it fun and keeps us going. What's the fun one? Well, that was fun, too. Yeah. <laughs> the fun one is just seriously for fun. I know we have a lot of wine lovers in the audience, and you mentioned wine. I was just curious what your guys' favorite I, I'm a big wine. Like, that's right. I drink a ton of wine. Um, 
Well, yeah. Jeez. Uh, no I, one's phones are out. You know, I mean, I do. Look, I love. I um, I've always been into food and bev and eating well. I think being able to do dinners out answers your first question. Like that. Anyway, I am a big red wine drinker. I love Cabernet. Right now, we're sponsored by Hall Wine in California. So if you want to drink that, but. Um, <laughs> I like a good Cabernet or Sauvignon Blanc would be like a sincere is what I drink. Yeah. Um, he is, like we do love to go out and take everybody a good dinner. So if anybody's got great recommendations for dinner tonight, let us know. Um, I love the cool thing about wine is it doesn't matter like the price of the bottle. It's really just your own personal palate. Um, mine's one called Black Chicken by Robert uh, Biale. It's like probably a thirty dollar bottle, but it's a red zin and it's just got a really cool story behind it back from the Great Depression and. I think it's really good. Awesome. Thank you all. Yes, thank you. Hi. Hi. Hi, thank you all so much for coming. Um, so I know you talked a little bit about marketing earlier, and I was wondering if you've ever considered product placement on other Bravo shows or just <laughs> reality TV shows in general as a marketing strategy? Yeah, we have. Um, Bravo's real strict about that. Uh, it's definitely just done on how well you get along with those execs and stuff like that. I mean, I'm sure there's a purchase price to do that, but it would be astronomical. Yeah. So it's basically done by my friendships with people on other casts. So you might see one of our pillows in someone's bedroom on like Vanderpump or, um, you know, on, you know, Summer House. Some of my pillows were there in early years, but. Even like on Winter House, they they just try to keep your branding out of it, so you have to do it really smartly. But yeah. right before Winter House, we had sweatpants that we didn't make at the time made with our logo on, so I could wear them around the house. We made you know beanies, and so of course, with millions of people watching, we try to take advantage of it. But um, the product placement about stuff has been a really unique kind of path for us with all the hotels in Charleston too. So we've been trying to figure out a, you know how like you can keep stuff, like you can open up a phone charger you forgot or eat from the mini bar or, or you know, drink from the mini bar. Uh, we were thinking about having pillows in the hotel and if you left with a pillow, you could purchase it. We're trying to find creative ways to get our pillows out there like that. But you did some of the product placement where they had, they, they did try to do, um, Bravo tried to, do that shopping platform, the one. Yeah, night. shoppable TV. So where they would like you would, they were showing. I think I can't remember the product. But we had to give like thirty percent. Yeah, they were showing it, and then NBC. you would scan the QR code, and it was it, it didn't work for us. Like we know what works for us, and that doesn't. Without getting into any contractual stuff with the network, like if you're if if it's position too many times it can they technically could have a cut of, of sales and we don't we really don't want that I, I will say though on season eight of southern charm which will be a great season there is a lot of heavy focus like this is the first time they really because we have a store now that they can that they did film a bunch in the store they've tracked our beach we were um filming the, the season finale but yeah i mean look at lover boy you know? i mean any show that kyle's on is a walking commercial I mean, it's for yeah, it's lover boy. um we're not really sure how he does that because yeah my, i wasn't allowed to do that on winter house and i threw a big fit and they took my box of stuff from me. It did happen. <laughs> um, which now I know if I was ever to do something like that again, to bring it in with me in my Prior own suitcase. It, yeah. But yeah, no, it's a great, it's a great benefit, but we're still working on it. I mean, it, it we talked about this at lunch. Like, it's a, a marketing vehicle that you can't pay for. I mean, to be on TV like that, and I think going back to the being organic and authentic question earlier and the answer, like Craig wears his stuff because he wears it on TV, not because he's like, oh, it's just going to get on TV. It's because he wears our stuff all the time, right? I think you just try to keep it that way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi. Do you all hey. have plans to open another store or do you oh, see more God. sales through the website? <laughs> you, you paid her to come up and do this. <laughs> Well, since everywhere we go, they ask us uh, to open the store there. Yes, I would love to. I think realistically <laughs> to get them to agree, we've got to, you know, we haven't been open for more than a year yet at the Charleston location. And we do have to see, you know, our data is going to be skewed because we had that influx of people from COVID. So um, I think if we can have a successful year two, then I would love to at least go to Nashville or somewhere else that our our core demographic is 
If not, then we will send some of our people to do pop-ups around the country for at least a month long because I think our st- there's something about, you know, a lot of people think retail's dead or, you know, that was kind of something people were saying for a few years, but there's a fun way to do it. Like my motivation for our store was I always loved walking into surf shops. I don't know why, but I loved going into surf shops. They always smelled really good. They always had good music playing and it was cool. So that's kind of how our store set up. We also have like a dual kegerator, we have champagne. And so it's kind of an experience to pop in our store. And I think we could replicate that in another city I realize that as, much, as ambitious as I want to be, there still is the smart business practices, which is why we're a secure company. So I would love to do that. Um, and that's definitely in my two to three year plan from now. Yeah, I mean, sure. No, um, I, it's a lot of work to open a store. Um, I, I'm not against it at all. I just know that like our numbers at the store in Charleston are unbelievable and we'll never replicate those numbers anywhere else. But if we did half of those numbers, it'd still be really successful by the retail purpose. We have to right? see if so it's because you just gotta look at there's it. a fantasy of seeing maybe that I'm there that day, which it's, it's, that's an absurd thing to say, I realize that. But the truth is like that is one of their concerns. Like if we open a store that's too far away and I'm not there a lot, is, does that fantasy not being there affect our numbers or are people really coming to Sewing Down South because they love the brand so much now? So. And I think it comes down to like the deal. I mean, we have a really good deal on our place. We're secure there, we're fine. But if we go to Nashville and they're like, $75 a square foot. I'm like, that doesn't work for us. Like, it just doesn't make financial sense at that so maybe point. We'll come to Baton so, Rouge. yeah, it'll come to Baton Rouge. They'll probably <laughs> charge us the same. No. So, I mean, it's a great question. I, I think it, it would be awesome and we'd love it. It might be a little different, not as big of a footprint. But if the deal points make sense, then yeah, we'll And do our it. wagons hits to it now, which is good. I think everyone's all in. So, mm-hmm. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. Hello, my name is Steven. Hey, Steven. Um, y'all talked about how y'all were expanding into bedding. What's y'all's next um, like expansion y'all are thinking about going into? Expanding into what? I'm sorry. Into like bedding, like what else? <coughs> are you looking, what so are that's going to be Matt. That's that's so because of our year last year and the success of the store is why Amanda and Jerry finally have said we're okay with making this business our primary business. Jerry moved from D.C. to Charleston. Amanda's there all the time. And now every month this year we have a new launch, whether it's a new collection of pillows, new like we're doing dog beds, which has been requested for a long time. We just, the price point on them, we didn't know what we were gonna do with. Um, the sleeping pillows are a whole new market, but we have so many requests for bedding that we're gonna start in sheets. We won't go to duvets or comforters yet, but we'll start with like a base level sheet. Um, she said we have a deal with well we're talking to a company called Dormify which comes in and it's basically a, a starter kit for your dorm which could be really it's great for us going like this. Um, yeah, I go. think it's a great idea I like that. Uh, it was just basically becoming what they have us on track for doing is becoming great at each one that we do and not until we are very solid in that can we move to the next uh, we have Miramine outdoor plateware coming out that we designed after our pillows Neither of us will ever be able to say it correctly. Yeah, but it's melamine, made, melamine. I, my mom gets mad at you me. You guys know what we're talking about, like the lightweight no, classic stuff? It right. Anyway, it's unbreakable. <laughs> Madison, how do you say it? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's unbreakable <laughs> plateware for outside by the pool, stuff like that. So we have outdoor pillows now that are completely weatherproof. And yeah, I would love to get in. Right now we have like soft kitchen goods, but one day I would love to have a knife line or plates and, um, well, indoor plates. But Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the direction we're heading. I think the bedding will be huge because that will really push us to decide what we want to do with our factory. So, thank you. Good question. Um, So, kind of, this is more of a fun one, I guess. Uh, Earlier, someone, I can't remember which season, but at one point you had, like, a meeting with Patricia. Yeah. And I feel like you kind of got a raw end of the deal where, you know, you were bringing your stuff, and, of course, now it's worked out. Um... You know, can you explain, so was, was sewing down stuff at that point, was that even a thing? Was that kind no, of... No, that was, that was actually a blessing in disguise. So, you know, for whatever reason um, it was, I did mess up that, right? So I was given an opportunity to start selling some pillows. I messed up, lost the deal. The blessing in disguise was they really just wanted to license my name and put it on pillows. Now, that's not why I messed up. I just didn't get it done. Um, and my heart wasn't in it. 
Now, you know, fast forward, we're happy it didn't happen. Um, but I think missing out on that really was almost my bottom in trying to start the company. And he called not soon after, which was good. Um, there's a really funny story behind that, but it was taken out of the book by the people that had to look over it. So I guess I'm not allowed to tell that story. But um, <laughs> look, we were filming at the time. Things get a little messy but like I said it was no one's fault but my own that yeah I had like an hour in the car as producers drove me there and we're like just put something together I had two months to do it but you know I was still hooked on Adderall at the time I was just which at that point it used to be my savior but without a test to study for then it just became this constant source of procrastination and it just wasn't good for me anymore so looking back yes it was a blessing in disguise but no I just totally messed up that uh but is that you mentioned like the producers were in the car saying okay we'll just put is that actually like an organic thing or is that kind of a an overlying arc that they say look you've got this talent for creativity and you like pillows what if we did a what if we put some of our cast members together and you did a company kind no, of no 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 i mean patricia saw her so patricia has a team of people that run her company and at this point, there was enough talk around my pillows that wasn't, you know, pillow company that wasn't real yet, that they were like, well, shoot, if Craig's not going to sell his pillows, let's sell them for him. So it was a great offer. They were like, look, you can come design for us and you'll get a cut from it. And now you'll actually, your pillows will be real. That was all organic. Me messing up was also organic. And then, you know, when she kind of burnt that by being like, well, Craig's a loser, you know, it all like went out. Then I was like, I have to figure out how to do this on my own. So it worked out in the end, yeah, okay. which was great. And then, no, Sewing Down South didn't come along until about six months later. So. Gotcha. Thank you. Yep. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? I wanted to ask, where, when did you decide to not just make pillows and make a big variety of items and why? It's a great question because that was always my goal. Um, I think if you could answer, I always wanted to do everything. Like if it was up to me, we'd have a million things that we sold, but Amanda's very good at keeping our SKUs down. When was it that you were comfortable with us making other stuff than pillows? Like outside of like, well, we'll call like hats and shirts and apparel like separate. Like, so let's say pillows. Well, first we did indoor pillows, then we did outdoor pillows and then nursery pillows. I can't remember off the top of my head was the first thing. Like the store has, <laughs> I mean, we had our SKUs and then the store came and then it was like, forget about it. We have so many, it's ridiculous. But, um, but why did you, so like when I wanted to do candles, you were very hesitant. I, it's just because the candles are very expensive. They are to, to get made. Um, and there are certain minimums that I didn't love about it, but candles, our candles are amazing. Um, and really it's, you have to keep growing. Like you can't just have pillows, like in the maturation of a business, you have to extend your product breadth, right? Uh, and we wanted to go from the indoor pillows to owning your, your patio, to owning your kitchen with aprons and oven mitts, and then um, moving now with outdoors, candles, right? Like it's trying to become an all encompassing brand, which is makes sense because we started with this and then we grow because it makes us money and it makes sense within the ethos of the company. But I think as I, <clears throat> as I was able to prove that the pillows sold, you know, it was a small kind of, you know, it, we gradually, I was like, look, I think this will be a good idea too. And it took faith in these two, mm -hmm. you know, him and Amanda to be like, look, Craig's idea with pillows we thought was absurd too, but it worked and it's kind of just taking a chance. But um, that we definitely had to have proof of concept of one thing to go to the next. And now, you know, we'll just keep growing from there. Thank you. Oh, thank thanks, you. Andy. Hi, I'm Emily. Uh, I had a question about y'all's partnerships and how y'all maintain and manage having a healthy and successful partnership ah. as friends. <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking about that earlier. I was like, dude, if something goes wrong, I'm really screwed. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> you're my agent, manager, business partner. No, it's a, it's a yeah, fantastic it's a question, question because you started off saying like you shouldn't go into business with friends or family. I think there's risk to that, but when it works, it's awesome. Um, what do you – I mean, I yeah. think we're pretty uh, – we're so separated in our duties that – we can focus on what each of us does yeah, well. Yeah, 100%. Um, we're also very opposite personalities, but Jerry's very patient 
with me and some reason just knows how to handle me very well and um, he knows what gets me like he just knows me very well um, I'm a very strong and kind person and passionate about stuff true and, you know very true we've had a, a, a tough few weeks with stuff being on television right now where Jerry's had to like calm me down a lot so he's just a good positive force in my life and a calming uh Course. I mean, it, it probably doesn't always work, but I'm trying to think of the fights, if we've had any fights. Usually we just disagree, and then we're like, all right, we'll take a vote on it. Yeah, um, I'd say from my perspective, well, he already said it, we we know what we're good at, and we stay in our lanes. I mean, true. not only are we like friends and business partners and agent, my sister-in-law is in this business. Like, you really want to complicate things? Like, let's, and she is a very opinionated human being. So, like, all three of us, but we, everyone knows what they're good at. Like, I don't care about the designs because you shouldn't trust what I have to say. He wants to make money, but he knows that I'm going to make us money. And, like, I know that Craig wants to have certain things in the store. He, he wants certain patterns. He wants things certain ways. So it's just a lot of give and take. And, and from the beginning, it's always been three partners who make three, who make decisions together. And we, we vetoed things he said, they vetoed things I've said. And it's healthy because no one's ever like horrible idea. We're not doing that. You might think it, but we're not going to tell each other that. And then we pivot and try to figure out the way to do it. There's and I, trust. yeah, I think that's just something you have to figure out in business too. It's like, you're not going to get along with everybody you work with, but you have to, I mean, we're, we all are genuinely friends, right? Like, and I think it goes back to, and you could ask Madison afterwards, like it's a family atmosphere. It's very <coughs> dangerous for a lot of places. You wouldn't do it, but it works for us. And, um, cause we're never you know, really like staying in your lane really works with us because like, I don't know what Amanda's doing right now, but I know <laughs> it's furthering like our product launches for the rest of the year. Like, I know that my job is to make sure that I have designed everything that we plan on launching like a few months behind. And he's just constantly finding vendors, switching vendors, tracking stuff. And um, I mean, he just had to tell one of our biggest vendors to piss off the other day because they were going through like an intermarital dispute in the company. And somehow he found us, you know, we're gonna save 30% on all apparel next year. So I know that he's doing that, but, um, yeah, we don't really bother each other. No, I mean, look, we definitely get, like, we were in Florida the other week, and we were, like, not agreeing on something, and, like, yeah, it probably wasn't pretty and good, but, like, the next day, we're like, all right, let's squash the crap and move on. Like, it's not, yeah. it's, it's just, like, we know that we have each other's best interests at heart, like, and especially just being a friend and his agent, like, I mean, I, his, his parents are phenomenal human beings, right? I know them really well. Uh, I know his brother really well they like I talk to his mom and dad all the time like he's not even involved with that right like and they know that all I care about is his friend and agent is to make sure he's taken care of like we're dealing with possibly going on a new tv show or a show again and we had to have heart to hearts so about the it one right that's gonna like get me sued and not, not yeah he'll be fine <laughs> but like you have to have real honest conversations with each other and it's like Everyone's so worried about making everybody feel so good about it and not upsetting people. Like, screw that. Like, we, you, we you have to be honest and tell people what's going that. on. Yeah, we're and very good at That's just, what happens. Yeah. Yeah. So if it works, it works great. Um, but I can, I mean, yeah, they're just, you just have to trust each other. Our goal is to make a really fun atmosphere for people to work at, to grow a business that, you know what, in five to 10 years, if we, potentially sell it that might be what we want to do i don't know like it just depends what happens that'll you know be our first fight. but yeah that'll be a big one um <laughs> <laughs> but I, I you know at the end of the day it's because we we look out for each other and it's not that yeah. we're trying to undercut people and you make each other feel good i mean it's just it's simple human interaction if you make mm -hmm. people feel special which there's definitely ways to make me feel special that have no that probably cost them nothing and i i get fooled by it but like, tell me I'm doing a good job. And I'll be like, all right, yeah, you guys can do, you know, whatever. So it's just understanding each other. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, what's Hi. up? <laughs> I'm Taylor. Um, I was going to ask, for your designs that, like, don't get used, have you thought about making them NFTs and making money that way? It's a great idea. One of my camera guys actually recommend something similar and he was like you should have a store in the multiverse i tried listening to some podcasts to explain them to me and even though i kind of like good at crypto or whatever that would mean i don't understand it yet but i know there's a huge space for it right now for our unused designs what we found ourselves doing is like when home goods came to us we're gonna have to get our margins way down for 
like the home good pillow that we make will be different than the one you can buy in our store. Just we have to get our cost way down. So we've started to use shell designs for stuff like that. Um, like Lowe's mm-hmm. and Home Depot are both pitching us how to make outdoor pillows for them. So we use the designs for that. That's a great idea. Um, I know that we are, I mean, honestly, we could hire someone to try, like, consult us to do that because, okay. yeah, you should send us a message because right now we don't, I just don't know anything about it except that I know that there's a huge, you know, So, like, there are my other businesses, like, I'm in conversation with people and in, in certain equity firms on the NFTs, but... That to me also is something that it's like very crypto will be around for a while for sure, but like it's what's the hottest next thing? Everybody's like want to be like, is it really going to stay around? Is it really going to be that important? Like everyone's going to it, and I think it's just different with people your age because they're like, oh, crypto, run into it, doing this, right? Like we had the same thing. It wasn't that at our age, right? Um, it's just a new hot thing. I, I don't. I mean, I think we can play in it, but I also think it's a little tchotchke to it, too. You know, it's like, how do I make a quick See, dollar? he's older than me. I get it, so I think... <laughs> I mean, I own crypto and everything. I don't own an NFT, but like... Because you, yeah. you don't know what they all are. Yeah, I know exactly what they are. Yeah, but my are. brother-in-law has them, and I look at stuff that he does. He's younger, and I'm like, I, I, I don't want to do that. I see the potential with it, and I, I would like to learn more about it because I know you can tie it into so much other stuff. So that's a great idea. Cool. Thank you. Respond to my DM, please. I got a little bit more of a personal question for y'all. Sure. I was wondering how y'all have seen yourselves grow since 2018. Like personally? No. Like no, like me about him? No, 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 no. Like about ourselves or about him or or him about me? Like how have you seen yourselves mature? I mean, you could do it through the company, but I was asking you on the like yourself level. I I would say I mean it would. I've heard Jerry answer this because he did it for the book. For me, <clears throat> I I was kind of a mess. I didn't know what I was doing. You know, it's so silly to have breakups affect you in the way that they do, but they just do. I mean, we've all been there, and you think you're above that, but a lot of times it's, it's a shitty experience. You don't know how you're going to get out of it. And so I moved to the Bahamas and I found myself and started this company, but I was still kind of relying on other people to do stuff for me. And it wasn't until... The pillow, po- the pillow party tour started where I had always wanted to see my pillows sold in stores instead of just on e-commerce. And so I helped, I went to this launch party of this, this small family's boutique in Camden, South Carolina. And when I got there, it was a huge party and there were 75 people in line for something I didn't even know I was going to be doing. I was going to be signing merchandise and we were drinking together and it was just fun. And I was like, this is what I want to do now. And so I put together this pillow party tour that was modeled after book signing events and we went around to these small mom and pop stores in the outside of big cities and we started to do big pop-up parties there which changed the entire course of our business and I think that's when you saw me start to grow into because I was always timid about well Jerry and Amanda like they're the business people like let me kind of let them they must know what they're talking about right that's how I was until this and that's when I was like look This is what we're doing. I know this is the answer. I know it doesn't make any sense, but I can see it. And I think that's when I finally felt an equal part of the business that I hadn't felt before on, you know, no one's fault other than my own. So I kind of took charge in that moment. And I now personally feel a lot more in control. And then I actually am a business person instead of just, you know, being an, an owner of a company. Yeah, watching him grow over the past couple of years, it's been one of the most, it really has been tremendously fun because he's, he started in a certain position and he's just come full on like controlling himself, the confidence and what he wants to do and where he wants to go. Like that's been a tremendous amount of fun to watch it and do it with him, right? Like see that happen, create a podcast, create a book, create an awesome, successful company with really great people working for us. So that's been a lot of fun. And then personally for me, um, I mean, I got married, so that was like a big growth thing for me, but <laughs> growth, like I, me to life is about growth, right? For me. So it's like learning and just constantly trying to figure things out. Um, and I think that's been the biggest change for me is just continually to push myself to try to find new ways you to do things. Yeah. I mean, company. like I had no idea to do anything with textiles or e-commerce and we built this really so far successful company and it's like, okay, cool. Like 
are we going to do it forever? I don't know, but what's the next thing or how do we keep growing it? And I think like continuing to ask why, why, like my favorite thing, I'm not a lawyer, he actually is, uh, but I read and write contracts for the past 12 years for like everything we do, events and all, like whatever. And I always look at a contract as a Word document on somebody else's computer. And what I mean by that is like, if you sign a contract with ever going back to ask for a change or ask for a question, that is the dumbest thing in the world you can ever do because it can be changed. And the fact is, just because it's a contract shouldn't be scary. And it's big, bad words. Go ask for the change, right? So like pushing yourself to learn is, is something that I just try to do every day. Thanks, man. Um, so kind of interesting that you kind of talked about that whole, whole lawyer thing, but I find your background really interesting that you went from going to law school, you know, passing the bar, whatever, and then you turned around and now you're the creative side of this company. So I guess I'm interested to hear like why you went into law and then in the future, do you think you're ever going to go back to that? <coughs> yeah, actually, <clears throat> a lot of it has to do with reality TV obviously coming into my life, but the reason I went into law is because no one ever introduced me to engineering. So what I found out later in life is that's what my brain was for, the math that I love. So I went to, I did college class, I went to University of Delaware in eighth grade for math and um, science, and no one ever, never thought to tell me that engineering is what I liked to do. So for me, it was either the medical field or um, being a lawyer. Um, because I figured I couldn't go into business until I was already like doing well. I don't know. For some reason, I just couldn't figure it out. Um, my dad had heart surgery once, and I like went in to visit him in the ICU. And before I even got to him, I like ran out of the hospital, and I was like, "This is not for me." So I was like, "I guess I'm gonna go into law." And I interned at the public defender's office my first summer. That's kind of how my brain worked. Was on the criminal defense side. I was too empathetic for it. I mean, every single person goes to jail. Like, so everyone that I was working just went to jail, it seemed like. And I was like, this is so much to handle. It just, it hurt my heart, like, every day. And so I went into personal injury where I was like, okay, well, at least if someone loses here, it's just money that they may or may not have been entitled to in the beginning. And I really enjoyed it, though. And I figured out how to tailor it around helping people and making myself feel like I was a difference, but it's also, I thought I could become a lawyer after going to law school and make a decent living. I mean, that's, like, I, I will never hide that I always wanted to make a lot of money, whether that was to give back or what, but I just, I wanted to be financially free. And so the big decision was when we were going into, in second season, like, you'll see me get fired or whatever. That's because once you start doing a show that much, you kind of have to make a decision. And I was like, what am I doing? Um, and so recently, but I've always wanted to get back into it. And so I started a law firm last year with the agreement with my partners was that I could run the pro bono side and we could bring in any clients that we wanted to. Because I was saying earlier, somehow we have like 70% of the people, the homeless population in Charleston are veterans, which I think is insane. Shouldn't even be a real thing, but it is. And so I want to do more with that. Um, we've recently decided to make a huge change with that law firm where I bought the law firm entirely to myself and now I brought in Jerry because <laughs> why not have him involved with something else in my life? Yeah. <laughs> um, and we're actually, the other partners saw me as more of a like billboard commercial Marketing attorney. vehicle, yeah. yeah. They were just, their plan was really just to use my face and that wasn't, it didn't bring in the clientele that we wanted and it just didn't work. And so There's we a reset, and now Jerry is going to do it from a business perspective, and we've brought in two of my good friends from college, and now we're going to start a firm in the way that we want to. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, I did. The big reason I was so scared about TV was I didn't want to close the door on law forever. Um, of course, I was never going to go work for some big defense firm after all of this. Like, it wouldn't be great for them, I don't think. Uh, but I think we're going to finally figure out a way to use the law degree. So I think a cool, like, off your question, so, because he's got, you know, sewing and law, the law firm, a couple other things. I have a couple of different things. Like, to your question, it's like diversification, right? So everyone's always like, diversify your portfolio, your stocks. You're like, yeah, you should. Great. But, like, why not diversify your income stream? So, like, you, and it's really cool for, like, the age that like, you guys are coming into. It's like, 
you don't have to just have one thing to do it. Like I would be constantly trying to figure out like, yes, this is my main source of income, but like, how do I make other money doing other things while not taking away from this? Because inevitably this will go down at some point where it gets stagnant or not be happy. And then hopefully something over here will help you um, when that time is down, right? Or that little passion. Um, I have a really good girlfriend from high school and she was selling striker medical equipment in college. And I was in grad school. I was like, yeah, give me a job. I want to go to striker. And thank God I did it. But she, you know, she was doing well. She was, hey, I'm starting this embroidery company. Like, I'm going to buy a machine from my basement. I was like, really cool. Have fun. Like, I want to go work at striker. Uh, yeah, she's got like an $80 million business now and crushes it. Like hundreds of people. And I'm just like, that is incredible. And she clearly doesn't work at Striker anymore. But like, that's a perfect example how something can just go that Shaq, to it. That Shaq meme that just came out on Instagram really has stuck with me that he like owns like, you know, 40 uh, Annie Ann's and like movie theaters and a couple Wendy's mm -hmm. or whatever. And I was like, see, that's what, that's my next goal is to start trying to diversify the income stream. Yeah. You, you don't have to have, you don't have to be rich to do it. Like, like, oh yeah, Shaq's kind of, he's got like bowling alleys and stuff, but <laughs> yeah. well, yeah, I mean, look, you guys have been awesome. Hopefully it wasn't too, uh, hopefully it wasn't boring, <laughs> but, um, yeah, hopefully you guys got something out of it and it was what you expected or a little entertaining, but. Uh, so, so one last question, hop into a time machine, go back to college at Charleston, not for a party, but to, to give yourself a little bit of advice, what would be one piece of advice that you would give to young Craig and young Jerry? Well, earlier I said I would go back to college in a heartbeat. <laughs> All the way over here, yeah. I was like, God, I loved college. But actually walking around your guys' campus, we didn't have school spirit because Charleston doesn't really have sports teams um, like you guys do. So having the generational school pride is really cool and something that we didn't have in Charleston. Um, I mean, God, it's, it's, it's a, a good, good question. question. I yeah. don't want to be. No, I would say write that. Finish your thesis paper in law school, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you have to wait three years to graduate until after that. <laughs> um, but I don't have any. I, I wouldn't change a thing with TV. I'm glad I, I did it, and I'm I'm happy with how things are playing out. And I think those really dark times that I were very self inflicted, which is in the book. I mean, my dark times. That's why I had a lot of guilt. Was because I did them to myself. Um, you know, all of them kind of add up if you can get through them and don't get in too much trouble where I'm at today. So, yeah, I, I'd say that's really good advice. And then treat everybody the right way. Don't don't treat people wrong. Treat everybody equally. Um, the janitor is no different than the person making five million dollars a year. You never know. Like the biggest gatekeeper to any big CEO you want is their secretary. Right. If you treat them like trash, we, we both agree on this. So. Um, we both worked in dining and fine dining and like, I think everybody should do it, but like you can tell a hell of a lot about a human being by going out to dinner and how they yeah. treat wait staff. You treat wait staff bad and I see it, like I, I literally won't talk to you because I'm like that's just that just says so much about who you are as a person to me. Um, and, and that's what I try to pay attention to is how people treat people. And pay attention to people where they leave their grocery cards. <laughs> I remember hiring for like Love a big it. company. Love it. I had a professor in college that told me that he would send someone after an interview to like run an errand in the grocery store or something, and he would have someone go to watch what he did with the grocery cart. Yeah, and I just <laughs> left it in the parking lot, yeah. which causes you know it costs money for the company for paying for damages in the parking lot, or if you're considerate enough to put your cart back. Anyway, yeah, yeah, just be considerate. Yeah. Nice. Or do they let the person in the middle seat on the plane have the armrest? Oh, that's a good one. You yeah. Know? Or if you just, yeah, God, just flying's a whole other thing. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, well, thanks, guys. It was really a pleasure to speak with you. Um, I, really I, I wish it. you the best of luck. I actually really enjoyed school. I hope you guys are having a nice time, too. Um, I always wanted to go to business school, but I didn't. I haven't yet, so... Um, I think we're good yeah, on that one. Congrats on everything, <laughs> and, uh, and good luck. And you can always reach out to yeah, our always. contact information on the cards, and, and we really do have a good team that reads over everything. Actually, one last thing, if I can. It's perfect advice for you. Don't get on LinkedIn and just LinkedIn people because you think it's cool to grow your network. Like, it's such a false, like, BS way to do it. It drives me crazy when people do that, right? Like, try to make a meaningful connection with somebody, not just be like, oh, they're in my network. Here we go. Um, and, and if you're going to reach out to somebody, have a, like, try to find something to connect with them on the email that's a personal relationship with them. Um, 
but again, just organic. Yeah. They're they're laughing because they think that I planted that, and oh, that's for real? yeah, it's, it's no. something I harp oh, on it, it constantly. Me insane. I, I connect with a purpose, right? When we were talking earlier, and I was like, yeah, if you like, if someone meets with me, I'm like, go to my LinkedIn and find the top ten people you want to talk to, and come. And half the people never do it because they're too lazy. But yeah, it drives me insane. And then after, God, it drives me crazy. Again, I I'm aware it's silly, but I will be <laughs> over there taking pictures with whoever wants uh, to. I love doing it. I don't care. I'm not saying that anyone wants to do that, but I will be. Okay. Somebody make I'll him feel good and take a picture with him, please. <laughs> yeah. so. All right, well, a big thanks to Craig thanks, and Gary. Guys.